Hello and welcome everybody. Welcome to this, the latest in the series of uh, webinars brought to you by the Chunk Foundation. Uh, so good to have you on board. For those of you who are here for the first time, a very special welcome to you. And for those of you who've been coming, uh, it's good to have you back on board. Some of you live on stream right now and others, you know, well, you've clicked on a little bit later on, on a later date. Welcome. Good to have you on board. I'm Peter and Dora. I'm going to be your host today. And um, it's an interesting day today, actually, because it's, today uh, is a very special day across the continent, African Traditional Medicine Day. And that perhaps might give you a clue about what we're going to be chatting about uh, today. Uh, but before we begin, uh, just to let you know, for, especially for those of you who perhaps are here for the first time, uh, CHOC is a non-profit organization in South Africa that uh, not only advocates for the health and well-being of uh, the youth diagnosed with cancer or life-threatening blood disorders and their families, but we also care for the survivors. Uh, since 2011, uh, CHOC has trained close to 5,000 traditional health practitioners on the early warning signs of childhood cancers. Pretty interesting, and uh, we'll be chatting a bit more about that. On the 21st of uh, November 2013, uh, Chuck held an open debate between Western and traditional medicine and 500 traditional practitioners and healthcare uh, professionals from all over the country, and they attended the day. Uh, the outcomes of this day um, was positive, and there appeared to be a general willingness and understanding on all sides to work together to find solutions to benefit children with uh, cancer. Now, each year, the Africa region, as I was just saying, commemorates African Traditional Medicine Day on this day, the 31st of August. And it's estimated that there are over 300,000 uh, traditional health practitioners practicing in South Africa, and that 70 to 80%, and that's a significant number, 70 to 80% of the population is thought to use traditional medicines or a combination of Western and uh, traditional medicine. So it's a really huge part of our life and our community and uh, cultural practice. Um, now, traditional health practitioners are respected within their societies and uh, they're not only fulfill the physical healing roles, but also feature significantly uh, when it comes to social and uh, political spheres. Now, some interesting information about the traditional health practitioners, uh, according to Act 22 of 2007 of uh, the Traditional Health Practitioners Act, uh, there are four categories that are widely recognized. Uh, the first one, diviner or sangoma, uh, is initiated in healing and then you have a herbalist who's not initiated uh, but has been trained in traditional healing uh, through generations by family members who were initiated uh, perhaps like a mother or a father uh, the third category is the traditional birth attendants uh, these are also known as midwives and uh, they receive uh, quite a bit of training uh, and then traditional uh, surgeons, Ingnibi, who are trained by older generation of Ingnibi to uh, initiate young boys into manhood. Now, this doesn't only cover circumcision, but a whole uh, range of training on taking care of the family as a man uh, after the father has gone, uh, as well as other important cultural practices uh, that uh, happen in most African households. And this helps sons uh, in all aspects of manhood. So that's what's widely recognized by Act 22 of 2004, those four categories. Uh, but I think there are some that sort of fall in between and double up, actually, uh, in this world. Uh, Western medicine, and we'll use that word, um, that's recognized as uh, the traditional healthcare. Uh, that you receive when you perhaps go to the doctor's office, a medical clinic, a hospital for urgent care. Uh, this type of medical care uh, uses pretty much scientific-based evidence, um, traditional science-based uh, uh, based medicine. Um, according to the WHO, 
uh, traditional medicine has a long history. It's the sum total of the knowledge, skill, and uh, practices based on the theories, beliefs, and experiences indigenous to different cultures, whether explicable or not, uh, used in the maintenance of health, as well as in the prevention, diagnosis, and improvement or treatment of physical and mental illness. Okay, so that gives you a background in terms of where traditional practices fit in with Western uh, uh, practices. And uh, I suppose you're probably wondering, what are we going to be asking today? Well, um, Chuck believes that uh, it takes a community to uh, heal a child. And so the question today we're looking at is, how can we work together or can we even work together? So that's something that we will unpack on this special day. Uh, and during the webinar, I'm going to be asking you a few poll questions uh, and to uh, I ask you just all to answer them. It gives us an idea of what you're thinking and also uh, uh, perhaps guide us a little bit more in terms of uh, your needs and this conversation. Uh, if you have any questions that you might want to ask during the course of this webinar, then please put your questions in the chat area and uh, we'll have uh, the questions answered at the end in the question and answer session. So use the chat function and uh, put your questions in there and we'll pick them up as we go along. All right, so Western medicine, traditional medicine, can the two work together? Can we work together? And if so, how? But first, let's get a sense from you um, what you think about all of this. And so my first poll question, it's coming up now, and there's three options. Uh, and there you go. The first, do you make use of traditional medicine? Uh, do you make use of Western medicine? Or do you consult both traditional and Western medicine when you're sick? All right, I'll give you a couple of seconds uh, to make a choice. Um, do you use both? Do you use mostly traditional? Do you use Western medicine exclusively? Uh, what are your own uh, preferences? What have, what have you done traditionally? All right, so I'll give you a couple of more seconds and then let's see how everybody has voted. Well, there you go. Uh, it's quite interesting there. 57% of you use most uh, mostly western medicine and 43 percent uh use a combination of both okay so that's and i suppose that's keeping in line really with uh what we generally have thought and understood especially given uh the statistics that i gave you earlier 70 to 80 percent of people have said that they use um uh, traditional medicine at some point Okay, all right, let's begin. And I want to introduce uh, someone to you who, if you've been here before, you probably know her quite well. Uh, Audrey Luddick is the uh, Program Development Manager of Chalk Childhood Cancer Foundation in South Africa. And in 2011, she started to train uh, traditional health practitioners on the early warning signs of childhood cancer. Audrey, good to have you. Thanks so much indeed for joining us. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, I'm very excited about this day and that we can um, talk about a very interesting topic. So I'm just going to quickly um, share my screen um, All right. and tell me if you can see it. Uh, we can't see it yet, but whilst you're setting it up, um, yeah, there it is. It's come up on the screen. Um, I suppose a, a first question might be, why is it important to train um, traditional health practitioners on the early warning signs of uh, childhood cancer? So during uh, 1999, the South African Childhood Cancer Study Group, they compiled the early, uh, the silly on early warning signs of um, cancer in children. So two thirds of children with cancer never reach specialist treatment centers. And the majority of those who do present in late stages of the disease. Now, during 2006, Dr. Stelios Biardis did a awareness campaign to educate 
um, public and primary health care workers on the early warning signs of childhood cancer in two of our nine provinces in South Africa, in Mapumalanga and in, um, in Limpopo. So the research then showed that knowledge on the early warning signs of childhood cancer leads to early detection and early detection saved the lives of children with cancer. The research also indicated that the training needs to be ongoing. So you cannot screen children like you do with adults. The important thing for early detection with children is you need to know the early warning signs of childhood cancer, how to refer and where to refer possible cases to. So in 2011, Chuck started our awareness training and education program to train healthcare professionals in how 10 on the early warning signs of childhood cancer. And very soon we realized that if we didn't include the feeder areas to the pedi pediatric oncology units in um, Gauteng, we would not reach the people who needed to hear the message that early detection saved lives. I also realized that if we ignore a very important group of influences in our communities, namely the traditional health practitioners, then we would not be successful in to increase the, the number of new diagnoses and save the lives of children with cancer. And then secondly, there are so many myths and beliefs that lead to stigma. And we need to demystify the stigma around childhood cancer and give people knowledge so that they can change their attitudes and practices so that we can increase the survival rate of children with cancer. Because early detection leads to higher survival and less disabilities. So that's the background on, on why we feel that the traditional health practitioners also need to know about the early warning signs of childhood cancer. All right, so I think you gave us a little bit of a clue for my next question. Um, it was really important to get the buy-in uh, especially from uh, the, the influences in the, in the sector. How did you get that uh, buy-in and, and gain their respect so that this training could happen? Peter, I didn't know where to start. <laughs> um, then somebody introduced me to the late uh, Petsilu Masiko, who was at that stage the leader of the traditional healers organization in South Africa. And when I met um, Pep Sila, she was very suspicious of what this white lady wanted and what I wanted to achieve. And when we started the conversation, um, I didn't really know how to gain her trust. And then I smelled that lovely fragrance of Mopeku. And um, immediately that took me back to my visit to a Himba village uh, many years ago in the most northern part of Namibia. At the village that was hundreds of kilom kilometers from the any town, I saw the most beautiful woman. And, but unfortunately, she had a huge tumor on her one breast. And I can remember that feeling of complete helplessness. And I shared my story with Pepsili and I said to her, if there was a traditional health practitioner who knew that it could be a possible cancer and who knew where to refer, and if she knew how to help this lady, this most beautiful lady might still be alive. Pepsi then understood my plea, and she then introduced me to the, the leaders of all the different traditional healers organizations in Gauteng. At that meeting, I shared with them the knowledge of childhood cancer, the early warning signs there are, and how we could work together to save the lives of children with cancer. They, of course, had many questions and many concerns. And after many hours of conversation, um, I said to them, we didn't want to take business away from them, but we need to get their buy-in and their commitment um, so that they can open doors for us, so that we can go into the communities and train um, people so that they can know, uh, so that they can have the knowledge. And then we started to train traditional health practitioners, um, not only in Gauteng, 
but also in other provinces of which I am very, very thankful for. Wow. All right. Another interesting thing that uh, you did on the 21st of November 2013, uh, Chalk organized an open debate between Western and traditional medicine. Over 500 people attended, I believe. Uh, what was the outcomes of this day? Because one, um, I don't know, rightly or wrongly, probably thinks that there's an us and them when it comes to Western and traditional medicine. Tell us about what came out. During the uh, during the first year, um, when we started to tra train the different uh, traditional health practitioners, um, Pepsi came to me and she said, now what's next? And I said, I made it clear to us, our focus are on childhood cancer and the early warning signs there are. We then decided to have this open debate between Western and traditional medicine and to invite the traditional health practitioners from all over the country. We invited the Department of Health, the MEC's office and healthcare professionals. And the debate, um, the, the debate was, was how could we work together? How could we, how could we um, br uh, uh, bridge the gap between the two of us? And the theme of the day was partnership in early detection of childhood cancer. And the outcomes of the day was to create awareness on the early detection of childhood cancer. And by doing so, to decrease the mortality, the deaths, and the disease in our country, the morbidity of the children with cancer. And at the end of the day, the traditional health practitioners praised child for reaching out to them and by empowering them with knowledge. They have learned a lot. And then they committed their willingness to work with Chuck. And I was so thankful. It was not, it was not easy at the beginning, but it was really a very, very positive day with a great, great outcomes. All right. That's that's great. And you asked the right question. So then you can answer this one. The question is: how can we then all work together to ensure that no child is left behind? So Peter, as you said, up to date, we have trained close to 5,000 traditional health practitioners. And we are privileged to have three traditional health practitioners that are child community trainers. So the most important aspect that came through the debate um, and, and working with uh, traditional health practitioners is mutual respect for each other. A few years ago, I was very privileged to uh, address the chiefs and the traditional leaders at the Makuyo tribal office in the most northern part of Venda. And they said to us, well, they said to me, talk to us and we will open doors for you. Because after my talk, these chiefs, they understood what the need was. And the chiefs and the traditional leaders have a huge influence in the communities and they respect the traditional health practitioners. And we said to them, we don't want to take the business away, but please work with us so that we, um, they know the early warning signs and so that they can refer to the closest pediatric oncology unit because together we can work um, and um, to reach the WHO Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer goal of 60% by 2030, and in doing so, save an additional million lives. So during 2013, at the UICC, that is the Union for um, Cancer Control in, uh, in the world, had a meeting in Cape Town, and their call to action was, cancer patients need the right care right now. It is most important, or this most important non-communicable disease, um, do not receive the, the, um, the priority that they should. So we ask, let's work together to save the lives of the children. It's because no child should die in pain. No child should suffer because they have cancer. And one day, as you can see on the slide, I saw a, a traditional health practitioner um, wearing a T-shirt and on it said, as a healer, I defend and promote what makes me to live and see tomorrow. So I ask, let's break the stigma and let's work together to create a better future so that our children can live and see tomorrow. Thank oh, you. Andrew. Thank you. Thank you so, so much indeed uh, for all the great work that you've done over the years and uh, bridging 
these two uh, uh, practices that uh, have all the same aims and uh, finding a commonality that uh, can help our children all the more. So thanks so much indeed for sharing that story with us and uh, giving us a good sense of, of the journey that we're on in uh, marrying Western and traditional uh, health practices. Audrey, thanks so much. It's good talking Thank to you. Thank you. All right, so let's do another poll. I'm actually intrigued and, um, you know, we've, we've heard what's been going on. And I just wonder, this is your question. Do you know that CHOC trains traditional health practitioners on early warning signs of childhood cancer? All right, so do you know? Uh, that's all you've got to do, answer yes or no. Do you know? that uh, CHOP trains traditional health practitioners on the early warning signs of childhood cancer. I'll give you a couple of more seconds um, to pick yes or no, and that will give us an idea of how much work we still have to do <laughs> or not. Um, all right, let's take a look and see what the results say. There you go, so 50-50. So, Audrey, we've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> we have so much work to do. But it's great. This, the journey has begun. Uh, we've, you've done a lot of training with a lot of people already. Uh, but again, I think we have to reach out even more. So thanks so much indeed. Now, um, if you need to connect with CHOC uh, for uh, any reason, please send a message on the following WhatsApp number. It's uh, 72 152 I'll give you that number again, 72 152 And uh, if you need to get hold of Ch Ch Chok. If anyone needs training on early warning signs of uh, childhood uh, cancer, please, please uh, reach out on that number. Okay, let's move on. And it's my great pleasure now to introduce uh, Catherine uh, Tanjana, who's uh, a traditional health practitioner and was also trained by Chok as a Chok community trainers. And now since 2018, Catherine has been active in the Sisonka District Municipality, spreading early warning signs amongst communities. So, Alsi, Catherine, thank you so much indeed for joining us and welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank How are you? you? <laughs> I'm fine, thank you, Nisam. Oh, fantastic. Good to see you. Um, I just wonder, how is childhood cancer stigmatized in the community that you work in? Because sometimes this can be a problem. Yes, um, but uh, my answer will be myths sometimes lead to stigmatization. And uh, what we experience most in, our, in the area where I work in Ufafa, there is a lot of myths. The myths will carry on until such time that there is no answer or there is no better for a better solution. Then those myths, they turn to, to the stigma. And for stigma, it is very hard. Uh, since I've said uh, myths, they lead to stigma. I mean that. Um, with the world that we are living in, we go with the beliefs. It depends on the area where you were born. It depends how you were raised. Even the outsiders, they affect your life with their own. Then that all of that at the end doesn't give us an answer. Number one, it doesn't give us a solution and it doesn't help. So then the next thing you'll find, it will be stigma. And for stigma, um, what I have noticed with the group that I've, all the groups that I've been with, they were not aware that stigma can cause, even they can lead even to death. They are not aware. Only when after training, you, because we don't only do the early awarenesses, only like the EWS, we, we do the early uh, warning signs, then we have, we have to go back and revisit. 
when you revisit, you have to do the stigma, you have to do, do the need. That is the only time when they realize that they have done a very big damage. There should have been much more many people who should have been heard, but they were not because of stigma. Yeah, that's a, it's a really big challenge. I wonder, I mean, you've been trained uh, now as a, as a uh, by chalk on early warning signs of childhood cancer. How has this information empowered you uh, to educate your community on uh, early warning signs of childhood cancer? Yes, I was trained by chalk in 2018. And um, at first, I was very scared because of a traditional health practitioner. Number two, I'm a bit old for this, but- <laughs> Never too old. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. But um, when getting into the program, I just gave myself that the most thing that I have to do is to bring change, to bring hope to our people. Yes, I was empowered very much in, in terms of knowledge. Yes, I didn't know, like if we can measure the knowledge that I have, it's much more better improved than before. And the empowerment was not only brought to me because I have carried on even to a, a sister organization that I work with, which is Uwazamoya. Uwazamoya is, is located in Ufasa. It's a very big area with about 19 Induna, which is, it means it's a very big area very very big so the knowledge that we have that was empowered powered with has been carried to another organization even trained the their staff like they are the, the, the all the staff has been trained and in all their awarenesses i go out with and which gives me a very great pleasure not only for myself but i'm very happy you know, Peter, especially when somebody will come in and ask me a question, even if it's not cancer related, I also <laughs> entertain it, yes, because that is whereby you measure and see that this person has a hope with you that you can bring a difference. I, I, really, I, I really like them when they, like, they, they ask me questions. And that is whereby I see myself, because you have to answer each and every question and you cannot tell a lie. It has all to the truth. So that's whereby you feel that, yes, now uh, really I was empowered. And uh, last week, yes, I was empowered because financial is going very well with talk. Thank you. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. That's a wonderful, wonderful story. Um, so what, what do you as a traditional health practitioner expect from CHOC to ensure that we save the lives of children with cancer? For me, I'm sure the best thing is to carry on with training the traditional health practitioners and make sure, talk must make sure that they also get other, other people who are like me, who are willing to be in the field. Uh, you know, there is a lot that needs to be done with the traditional healers in terms of changing their mindset. Number one, we always know that that's what people think or they know, that uh, cancer kills, which is it's not like that. If cancer has been detected earlier, a life will be saved. But people don't know that. The second one is that uh, people do not know that um, there is childhood cancer. In all the areas, in all the groups I've been to, they don't know that there is that uh, there is a childhood cancer. Always people they know about breast cancer, um, pro, uh, throat and whatever cancer. Those are adults. So they don't know. So somebody needs to remove that 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 concept with them. And number three, there is a mindset with traditional healers. I'm also a traditional healer that um, other traditional healers have the, the, that gut to say, I can heal this, I can heal everything. They don't understand. Even a simple blood pressure, you can't heal it. You understand, I'm talking about diabetes. It's worse with cancer. We need, chalk needs to get 
more of traditional healers who could be also trainers like myself and to get who are really willing to get into the field and be with that like when i'm training i'm talking their own language which is i know what would be the consequence of this if you don't get this this will be like this so i mean i'm sure talk needs to get more of traditional healers to be on the field and train them to to clear off that mindset of um traditional health practitioners especially those old men and grannies <laughs> who are traditional healers <laughs> I can see Audrey nodding and taking notes. I am pretty sure that uh, she's heard you, and this is something that will happen. Asi Catherine, thank you so much uh, for for joining us, and thank you for the work that you're doing. Siabonga uh, kakulu. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. That's uh, fascinating. I mean, we've we've heard. Um, quite a bit now about uh, traditional healthcare, traditional practices, and uh, Western uh, medicine, which we've uh, all experienced one way or another over time. So I'm going to ask you this question now. There's another poll that we're going to do. And uh, this is the question for you. Do you believe that healthcare professionals and traditional practitioners can work together in the healing of children with cancer? So that's the question. Um, do you believe that healthcare professionals and traditional practitioners can work together in healing children with cancer? Yes, no, maybe. What are your thoughts? I'll give you a couple of seconds uh, to get your thoughts on that one. Can they work together? Is there a way? They're certainly having discussions already and debates, and I think there's common ground um going forwards and listening to us Catherine just now uh, I think there's an understanding that um a lot can be learned from our traditional uh, practitioners and also I think western medicine so there you have it an overwhelming 85 percent say yes and uh 15 percent say maybe and that's great um Absolutely. Thank you so much indeed. That, that, that is brilliant. Okay, now it's my great pleasure to welcome somebody quite special to me, actually, because I once worked with her daughter years and years ago on the television. Uh, she's all grown up and I'm older. <laughs> but it's good to, to have you, Asi Aida Khoya uh, Dira. She's a uh, social auxiliary worker at the Pediatric Oncology Unit at the Chris Honey Baragwanath Academic Hospital. It, and in 2010, uh, she did a presentation uh, in Washington, in DC, in America. And the topic was African Traditional Practices, a challenge on pediatric palliative care for children in Africa. Alsi Aida, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. All right. Now, we're fascinated by this conversation now. Um, African traditional practices. Now, they follow two streams, African traditional healing and uh, African traditional churches. In your experience, how can we work together to best the best interest of uh, children with cancer? Sure. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Peter. And I'm just so blown away by what Catherine has just said. We, we need a lot of the, the Catherine, you know, in our, you know, in our work so that we can, you know, uh, work together for the best interest of the child. So um, in my experience, Peter, is that what I have learned is that childhood cancer spreads very quickly if not treated early by qualified doctors. I have realized that in most cases, childhood cancer is something new to our parents. You know, during the, uh, the counseling sessions, they, they just cannot believe. They say, how can a child have cancer? So it's something that is new to them. So that's where intense counseling comes in from the psychosocial team that we have uh, uh, so that the parents can really uh, uh, understand so that uh, we can really work together. 
So during consultation, uh, we are privileged, you know, uh, lucky that they are able to open up to us more than to the doctors. Unfortunately, that you know, you know, I took my child to a traditional healer looking for a cure because they believe that the child was bewitched. So they, they get open to us, and 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 unfortunately, we found that the treatment they've received was not effective, and they only brought the child when the cancer was already advanced, and nothing could be done to help the child. So this has been the problems that we, we have most of the time. And to answer your question, Peter, uh, uh, African traditional practitioners and faith healers are most the first to be consulted by the communities in most cases, by parents when a child is sick, because they cannot take it when they say the child has got cancer. So they consult first there. So they play a very, very important role. And we respect their role so much because uh, without them, I mean, it's like, it's, we, we, we can't do anything because we need, uh, as Chalk is doing with, you know, um, awareness campaign all the time, which is very, very important as they've done such a good work in just a, 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 a educating, just going through a, 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 all the traditional practitioners. And my plea to our partners, them, the, uh, they are our partners, is to ask them to refer children as soon as possible once they see the early signs of cancer. Because according to the way they have been trained, you know, they, they should be aware and, 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 and know the signs of cancer. And how I wish even Catherine, you know, we can have more Catherine so that all of these uh, uh, traditional uh, uh, practitioners can know all the signs. And this does not take away anything from them, you know, but will ensure the survival of the child because cancer can be cured when detected early. Because as our theme saying, it takes a community to heal a child, you know. Finally, Peter, here we talk about the, in the interest of the child with cancer. Our partners, which are tra traditional practitioners and faith healers, have to acknowledge that cancer treatment needs Western medicine. You spoke about Western medicine and, and not African traditional medicine, medicine or faith healing. I have witnessed that whereby parents on the side will try and give the child something from a, a, a traditional practitioner. And, and that complicates you know, the treatment. And sometimes it leads to death when these are mixed. It just causes some complication. So that does not you know, mix. So it's very important for them to know that you know, once a child is on cancer therapy, cannot mix a, a, a other medication. I think that is the, 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 what it can really go to them so that they can really teach one another or just go further with the trainings and you know, so that they know the, the good things they have to do. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, I mean, as you were speaking, I, I kept on thinking that um, there has to be a greater understanding about limitations how far one can go and uh, where one picks up uh, and also that western medicine mm. desperately needs the traditional uh, setup to reach all of these people that need care so mm. um how else do you think we can work this collaboration between uh I i'm saying two sides but that's not the word i want these two avenues to help Mm. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's the collaboration is just more, more, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, as, as, as Chalk is doing awareness campaign, you know, uh, like Catherine said, we need all these uh, uh, the, the traditional practitioners to know about cancer. I think that is very, very uh, important. And even just reaching out to those old 
old uh, 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 men and women of traditional uh, practitioners to, to really know that once you see this sign, please refer to, to, to the uh, pediatric oncology because we do collaborate, we, we do uh, need to collaborate with them because they, they are the first consults. It's very, very important that they know. So we thank Chuck so much for the work that they are doing. I know Atri has been doing this for so many years, trying to, to get them to collaborate so that they can know more about and, and the understanding of what cancer is. Because uh, the, the, the sad thing is, Sometimes even we think you have won the, 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 the you, you have won them the, the parents and then they will come uh, uh, amazingly that they will come to you and say okay yeah this is they, they say it's cancer yes it's cancer but Mtanawa, my child has been bewitched so wow. it's like it just goes a long long way so we as psychosocial we we really stress on you know, the, the counseling so that the parents can also know and understand because we, we, we have a lot of, uh, most of our parents are uh, illiterate from the uh, homelands, Northwest, who really have no knowledge about uh, Western medicine. So it's like we do more counseling, especially in, in the uh, intense uh, counseling, even, uh, to the case of making a drawing so that they know exactly what you're talking about. So I don't know if I've answered your yeah, question. You have, you have, Asa Aida. Thank you so much indeed for that. And I think one message that's coming through loud and clear is that this isn't a competition. It's yeah. not about who is better, who knows more, but rather how do we work together uh, to get the best outcome uh, for our children. So thank you so, so much indeed for reinforcing that message for us and uh, joining us. And please, my love to your daughter. Yes, <laughs> our, our... Take care. Thank you so much. Yes. All right, let's carry on with our conversation. And it's my great pleasure now to uh, welcome the Director for Traditional Medicine at the National Department of Health, uh, the Director to Traditional Medicine is responsible for the facilitation of policy and legislation uh, development related to traditional medicine and the provision of health awareness programs for traditional health practitioners, amongst others. And uh, the Director is Mr. Bruce Mbezi. And we say good afternoon to you. Thank you so much indeed for joining us and welcome. Good afternoon, Peter, and good afternoon to my colleagues. All right. Before we even go far, I want to say I love your shirt. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> All right. So let's start with uh, the efforts that the department is doing in trying to include uh, traditional medicine in the national healthcare system. Now that we have a full understanding of um, how reliant our people are on traditional values, um, traditional figures in terms of their health care. How are we incorporating them more and more into the healthcare system? Thank you very much. Um, first thing that I would like to say is to, um, to thank all the, organizer, the organizers of this webinar, uh, because it um, assists very much in trying to raise awareness and to con it contributes to the awareness of the and the importance of the work that traditional health practitioners are doing <clears throat> in our communities. Then um, coming to your question, you will, you, I'm sure you are aware that traditional health practitioners currently are operating in a, in a sort of, in a way of sort of informally or outside of the national health system. So, so there are efforts that the department is trying to do um, especially emanating from, from as far back as um, um, the Alma Atta Declaration of 1978. That is where um, 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 health practitioners started to, real, to, to realize and recognize the contribution that traditional health practitioners um, um, have and does in the, in the, in the primary healthcare system. So after the, the, the 
Alma Ata Declaration, um, the WHO Afro region also um, um, came up with an action plan to say that member states of WHO in Africa should also include um, traditional uh, health practice in the national health system. So South Africa as one of the member states um, also had to uh, uh, come up with some efforts to do that. Um, first thing that we do is, 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 is that um, we need to, to, to include the whole practice um, uh, into the national health system, but including it in the national system will, will need the department to develop um, several frameworks um, uh, 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 to make that happen. For example, um, the, the department has so far developed a, a, a legislation which is called the Traditional Health Practitioners Act, number 22 of 2007, which we are currently uh, implementing. So the, 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 the act itself requires the department to um, sort of regulate the profession. The profession, um, uh, uh, um, actually when we're supposed to regulate it, um, uh, the legislations require us to legislate, to regulate it in threefold. We, we have to regulate the practitioners, which are our human resources. We have to regulate the practice itself. And, and, and thirdly, we'll have to regulate the products because um, um, uh, this profession or this, this system also has got its own uh, products. So the department has uh, uh, actually uh, develop, uh, uh, appointed the council, uh, which is called the Traditional Health Practitioners Council, which is aimed at regulating the practitioners. And in doing so, um, we, are, we are trying to formalize the practice. That is why now um, um, uh, um, we, are, we are saying, we are calling them traditional health practitioners rather than calling them traditional healers. They are mm -hmm. part of the family of our health uh, practitioners. So, so um, uh, with regard to the, to the, to the uh, products, SAPRA itself also has got um, the mandate to regulate all health products uh, within, within, within the country. So they are also, uh, they have also established a unit which is going to uh, be responsible to regulate all products that emanate from traditional medicines that are supposed to be um, commercialized. They will only regulate those that, uh, that uh, need to be commercialized. And then the, the, the products that uh, uh, traditional health practitioners used in their practice um, will not go uh, uh, through that system of, of SAPRA because we are uh, actually regulating the practitioners themselves. So mm -hmm. they are, their medicines in the, in the practice uh, uh, goes hand in hand with what they, they do uh, as practitioners. And also, um, uh, um, um, with regard to the Traditional Health Practitioners Act, already the department has appointed a registrar. We've got a registrar in place who is pre uh, doing preparations for um, uh, this um, formalization of traditional health practice. We, 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 the minister has appointed a the Interim Traditional Health Practitioners Council, which is aiming at um, implementing all these regulations that I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So, so we, we are actually a little bit uh, advanced in terms of trying to include the, uh, the, the, the traditional health uh, practice in the mainstream uh, 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 health system. That's fascinating. So um, I guess the question then that comes is, how um, is the collaboration, collaboration going between the traditional health practitioners and the clinics uh, facilities that uh, uh, are under your management? So uh, the collaboration at the clinic level is supposed to be managed by the, by, by the policy. So the department currently has got a draft policy which is uh, currently going through internal processes for finalization. That policy will enable um, um, traditional health practitioners in a certain area um, to work hand, hand in hand or to, to work together with the, with the nearest facility. 
um, um, traditional health practitioners, as I've indicated, that will, they will be required to register with the interim council to receive their, their um, uh, um, uh, practice number or their license to practice. Then the clinics, um, will, we, will, we will develop a system where it's a clinic is supposed to map all traditional health practitioners around that clinic so that they, they should develop a certain relationship. And also the fact that um, um, the issues of referral, referral is a policy issue. Currently, the policies that we have are, are, sub, are, are, are in the process of being reviewed to also include referral, referral um, by traditional health practitioners to the clinic, wherein um, we also have to, to, to develop a um, 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 referral letter that, that should be used by the, by, the, by the traditional health practitioners. But currently, uh, uh, what is happening is that until such time that um, uh, uh, all uh, uh, traditional health practitioners are registered with the council or are regulated, is then that we will also develop or review policies for the, for the back referral, referral from clinic to traditional health practitioners, because currently they are not yet regulated and then we cannot take risk of referring uh, from a clinic to somebody who is uh, legally not yet um, uh, being uh, regulated or registered. Peter, unmute yourself. Okay. I'm busy chatting away on the mute button. Uh, I was just saying thank you very, very much indeed for that. Uh, perhaps one last uh, important question, because today is African Traditional Medicine Day, and I just wonder how important that day is and its uh, relevance, uh, the relevance of the WHO theme for this year. And traditional medicine is celebrated every year from the 26th of August to the 31st of August. So from the 26th of August, we, it's, it's a traditional medicine week. Um, and the last day of that week, which is the 31st, is African Traditional Medicine Day. So this week was identified by ministers of health um, who um, came together uh, in Ouagadougou in, in, in Burkina Faso in 2000. And then um, they drafted a, a, a plan of action and they also um, identified the period where they were sitting there from the 26th to the 31st to do all these things. They identified it as a, 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 a date which that should be commemorated or celebrated as African Traditional Medicine Week. So every year we receive a theme from WHO Afro, which tells uh, us um, um, or which informs us how we should maybe celebrate um, the, 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 the week um, in that year. And then this year's theme, it says two decades of traditional medicine uh, in preparation of the universal healthcare coverage in Africa. Um, the universal healthcare coverage we know is our NHI. So, so since 2000 until now, uh, already the, uh, two decades has lapsed. So they just wanted us to sit, sit back, uh, look back and uh, um, take stock of what we have done in terms of uh, preparing the inclusion of traditional health practice into the national health system uh, or into the national health insurance. So, so as South Africa, when we look back, um, we can see that we have done some of the things that are preparing us to include traditional health practitioners in the national health insurance, because the national health insurance talks about um, healthcare service providers. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you are a, a private hospital or you are a private doctor or you are a what, as long as you, you provide healthcare, you are, uh, classified as a um, healthcare provider. So our traditional health practitioners will also be included in the NHI, provided we are done with all these things of regulation, because we need to regulate them. We need to put systems in place um, so that when we say uh, 
And now you are ready for national health systems. We've got legislations that are in place. We've got policies and, uh, and all these other things. Registration has taken place. So for us as uh, uh, the Department of Health uh, in South Africa, we are uh, quite um, happy of the progress for us marching towards the inclusion of traditional health practice in the national health insurance. Well, and it's a, it's a great endeavor. And I know that uh, it's initiatives such as this that uh, can only benefit the ultimate beneficiaries, which are our children and our people. So uh, thank you so much indeed uh, for sharing your thoughts and uh, giving us some clarity about some of the initiatives that the department is doing. Thank you so much. But I want you to hold on because I want to find out uh, if we've got questions. And um, maybe can I ask you, um, Hedley or Audrey, uh, just to pick up a couple of those questions um, uh, that I'm not even sure where to start. There are three, there are actually three questions at the moment. Very interesting. Yes. Okay. okay, so Bruce, this question is for you. How far are we with the registration of the PHPs by the council? Um, it's a major stumbling block. I don't know, would you like me to do the other two questions as well? Yeah, yeah. Well, let's do one at a time and then uh, so that okay. everyone can follow. Okay. 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 Um, um, registration um, for traditional health practitioners with the council has not yet started. Um, I have indicated that a minister has appointed the interim traditional health practitioners council, um, which was appointed for a term of three years and then um, a minister had to extend their term because they didn't finish their work by another two years. So that two years also has um, expired. But during that five years, they have appointed a registrar and the department has, appoint, has established the office of the registrar. So the registrar is currently busy trying to put up institutional arrangements. Hence, I was indicating the issues that uh, um, the registrar is, cap is busy putting up um, databases, is busy putting up uh, 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 um, uh, uh, the, the staff of the office of the registrar, and also the fact that the previous council also developed some um, re uh, regulatory tools, such as um, um, the code of conduct for traditional health practitioners, code of ethics, and all these things. So immediately, now uh, we've got a problem that um, minister is about to appoint the second council because that council's term has ended. So, so immediately when the minister finalizes the appointment of the of this council, of which the process has been done, we we have. Uh, um, 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 Uh, Mr. Mbezi, it looks Mr. like we'll have, we'll have uh, appointed okay. we'll have appointed the council. Then um, registration will start from there. All right. Okay. I'm mindful of time, so I'm going to hurry us up a, a little bit. Maybe we've got time for one more question, uh, Audrey. There's one more question, the interesting yeah. one. Is yeah. there buy-in from the, the traditional practitioners? To get registered and pract and uh, the practice regulated. So basically, is there buying from the traditional health practitioners um, to be registered and uh, so that the practices can be regulated? Um, absolutely. Um, um, all traditional health practitioners are ready um, for registration, including their associations. Um, I am currently today from uh, addressing. Um, a, a celebration for traditional healers organization in Mpumalanga. Um, they are all waiting for uh, 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 the day when um, and they are called to register because they all know now what is the importance of being regulated and, and being registered. Okay, Mr. Mbezi, thank you so much indeed. And um... Audrey, thank you so much uh, for facilitating that. And uh, I suppose all that's left is to give the final word to the CEO for the Ch Childhood Cancer Foundation, just to conclude and wrap up uh, today's 
uh, uh, webinar. Thanks so much, uh, Hedley Lewis. Thanks so much, Peter. I think that to all the the celebrants of uh, of today, I think that to all the speakers of of this incredibly um, well diverse panel, I think that it's it's amazing to hear the heart and the love and the passion, not just by and for the traditional practitioners, but also the love of supporting the, the families and the patients. I think that for us, you know, I think the common theme that we're all aware of is that it's imperative for every child that is diagnosed with childhood cancer is treated within a specialized oncology unit by professional specialists being the pediatric oncologist. I think in South Africa, we use internationally recognized and tried protocols uh, that, that obviously have been successful and hopefully will continue to be successful. I think that we all have to acknowledge that if a child is diagnosed early, that, uh, that their survival rate obviously is going to be much higher, and possibly even in the 90%. However, delays in treatment can lead to death. And I think that, that, I think that what we're hearing about today is about early diagnosis, early referral, as best as possible prognosis. And that will, re re the result obviously is a reduction in deaths. I think that we call on the traditional practitioners, we call on South Africa to reach out to all children with cancer and to work with us, to work with, with, our, with our governments and, and to work with South Africa in order to help those that desperately need the hope. You know, I, I look at the panel and I, I'm really touched by, by really personalized stories. Um, and I think that, that it's only testament to, to a country and a community that really is invested in our people. I think that a special thanks has to go to, to Catherine, to Mum Ada, and then uh, obviously to, to Mr. Bruce Mabetti. Thank you very much to all of you that have joined. To you, Peter, I think that you're a common, you're a <laughs> common person, you're a common individual, but, but yeah. there's nothing common about the way you support yeah. Chuck. So for that, yeah. thank you very much. I think that to Brand Race, our special technical team that go that extra mile, and I know that Wayne does not like to have his name mentioned. He likes to be behind the cameras and not in front of the cameras. To him and his team, a special thank you. And then finally, a word of thanks to, to South Africa. And, and the final word has to be one of refer, 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 create hope and help our people. So thank you very much. Hedley, thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed. And uh, uh, to everybody, um, very important. If you have any questions, so if you need to refer a child who may have cancer, please, please visit the CHOC website. That's www.choc.org.za or you can call this number 072-152-2351. One five two two three five one, or that website again www.choc.org.za. Um, through the year, we're going to be having uh, a number. We we'll continue with this uh, series of webinars, and uh, CBCPD accredited uh, webinars on childhood cancer as well. So um, please um, uh, tune in, log in be part of these conversations uh, we're going to be having uh, more of these and continue with this series because i think it's so so important and you'll be able to find the links uh on youtube of uh, previous emails on the chalk website events page as well uh, just in case you missed the last ones and this was your first one uh, i hope you certainly found it as fascinating as i did uh, but it's a great work that everybody uh, that's been in this room is doing and continues to do. And uh, it may not always be recognized as such, but it is not a small thing. It is not a small contribution. It is huge. It's enormous. And for every child that we give hope to, thank you so much for the contribution that you're making. And uh, yeah, let's thrive. Let's live strong. Take care, everybody. And we'll see you at the next webinar. Bye-bye.